Good evening, ladies. Oh, I love, love, love Women's Midweek. And I love each and every one of you. I know we haven't been gone that long, but it feels like we just got back. And it's just incredible to be here tonight. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to hop right on into the lesson. In 1 Corinthians 2, we're going to pick up in verse 6. And just give me an amen when you get there. Oh, I love looking at you guys. You guys are just smiling back at me. Is anyone flipping? <laughs> I hear some pages turning. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, the Bible reads, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. And I love this scripture. I love how it makes me feel, right? Reading over this, God has a wisdom specifically for the mature, right? Where if you're not in God's word, not walking with God, it's almost something that will go over your head. And in fact, it was something that went over people's head because it said had they grasped it, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. But it says still to this day, what no one has seen or heard or conceived, God still has in store. And the title of my lesson is The Best is Yet to Come. The Best is Yet to Come. And I just have one question for you ladies tonight. Are the best days of your life behind you? Or are they before you? Because when we walk with God, he tells us that the best days are still before us. And so point number one, the worst of me. And point number two, the best of God. All right, we're going to start off with point number one, the worst of me. Still in 1 Corinthians, but we're going to go to chapter one. And just give me an amen when you're there. To your left. Or scrolling, if you're scrolling. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 to 31. And the Bible reads, <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Isn't this scripture amazing? Paul is speaking, and he talks about what our lives were without God. None of us were influential, were of noble birth. None of us had anything to really brag about. And yet it was in that position that God called us to be with us. Chosen, special, royal. And I think of who I was before I was a baptized disciple. And I know I preach on it often, how much I was a hot mess. But really, I was a hot mess, right? Extremely prideful, so disconnected from the world around me. I just numbed out by working. I think of the things that I would say, the things that I would do, trying to find security in the things and the people around me. Um, and just to know that, wow, in First Peter 2, he says, 
He chose me out of the darkness to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and his special possession. And I got baptized, repented for my sins, and then got baptized. Let me tell you the order, right? Because it matters, right? In God, it matters. And I became a disciple, and it was incredible. But here's the thing. We can sometimes deceive ourselves into thinking we're standing strong and fall. We can still have worldly hearts if we're not continually purifying our hearts. And I just want to be open with you all. You're my family. And over the past couple of weeks, I found myself going back to the woman that I once was. These past couple of weeks have been really difficult, probably for many of us, whether it's been health challenges, financial challenges, people that we love leaving, people that we've poured our hearts into, relationships that we cherished. Um, and I think particularly for me, I took a really big hit emotionally. And I think all of it culminated to this Sunday where I just realized just, just how much um, I was hurting, right? Um, most particularly just my relationship with one of the, the sisters who left. You know, I really gave my heart to her. I really loved her um, just with all of my heart, just the, the memories, the advice, um, just her counsel, her presence. She was like a mom in the faith to me in a lot of ways. And when she decided to leave, I felt betrayed, you know, um, especially after some of the things that were shared. I'm like, what happened to that? You know, why aren't we still fighting? You know, I felt really sad. I felt really angry at Satan. You know, like, why would you do something like this? Because I know this isn't just someone that I cherish, but it's someone that all of us cherish, right? Um, and then another hit on Sunday, just with my husband, one of the guys that he reached out to that he baptized and seeing him in tears crying because of just how much that relationship meant to him. Um, and even just grateful for Allie because Sunday right before leaders, it was just so much going on and we just went and we prayed together and just seeing her cries and her tears, just wondering for the teens, like who's going to lead them? Will they still feel loved and chosen and led by God, you know? And so I got home that Sunday and everything in me just wanted to check out emotionally. And you know you're trying to check out emotionally when you're going on YouTube to find solutions to your problems, or you're trying to Google like how to overcome this when you literally know where the answers lie. So that's kind of where I was. And so I'm on YouTube, how to renew my mind with God, and I'm watching this video of this person just, and it wasn't helping me, it just wasn't helping me. But there was a sister who had sent me a lesson a while ago and so I'm going through the notes, and I stumbled upon this scripture in Matthew 5, and it gave me such a different perspective. In Matthew 5, verse 8, please turn with me. In Matthew 5, verse 8, and you'll remember this from the Sermon on the Mount. And verse 8, it says, bless are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And I don't know why the Holy Spirit led me to camping out here. I'm just like, okay, what's up? Like, am I not pure in heart? Am I not blessed? Like, what's going on? Like, what are you trying to show me? But I started to think about it, and it says that they will see God. And I just really thought to myself, Has I, have I stopped seeing God? Have I stopped seeing God in the circumstances around me? Have I stopped seeing his sovereignty? Have I started to focus on the people who are leaving or the hurt that I feel or the tough situations and the infrastructure changes and the gaps that need to be filled and I've stopped seeing God? And I'm really grateful because we just came back from a region leaders retreat and Jason preached about apathy. And he asked us, in what areas of our walk with God have we become apathetic? And I realized that this was the area of my walk with God, where in order to self-preserve and not feel more pain, what I started to do was just work and just show up to meetings of the body, still having my quiet time, still praying for, through my feelings, but not waiting for my heart to actually transform. 
and not getting open on a temptation level about the different things that I was feeling. And as I'm confessing in the D group, one of the sisters shared a scripture with me. She's like, Regine, you have to pray until you feel hope again. And as I went out the next morning and I prayed until I felt hope again, I realized, like, man, I'd stopped dreaming for the women's ministry. I stopped dreaming that it wasn't just another problem that was going to come, but another miracle that was also going to come, that there were going to be victories, and that instead of focusing on those who are not here, I get to look at the women who stayed here, the women who are still fighting on the narrow road and still fighting to encourage and build up one another. And so, sisters, tonight, you're my good news because you showed up. There are 13 kids here tonight at midweek. Moms who did not make any excuse to be here because they wanted to be in the sanctuary of God, worshiping with their fellow sisters. But I put it before you, sisters. Many of us aren't apathetic in the sense of numbing out with TV or numbing out with social media. Some of us are, right? I was there on Sunday or trying to be there on Sunday. It didn't work, but I was trying to be there. But we can see apathy creep into our lives by going from job to job, appointment to appointment, church event to church event, sharing time to sharing time, physically present but spiritually absent. Where we stop taking notes or we're taking notes but we've stopped listening with the ears of our hearts. And God is calling us to be passionate again. He's calling us to be zealous again, to be in love with him again, to purify our hearts so that we can be blessed and that we can see him in the situations happening around us. And so maybe some of you are studying the Bible right now, and maybe you doubt that you can do this. You doubt that you can be committed. You doubt that you can become a disciple. But here's the thing. God believes in you. The reason you're here is because he chose you. He could have chosen anyone, and yet you are the one that someone reached out to. Or maybe you've been a disciple for a while, right? And a while is a relative time because we have people who've been disciples for 42 years and for two weeks in our congregation. And, and And we have our own set of challenges that come with that. But God is calling you back into an intimate relationship with him where it's not about being religious, but it's about having an intimate relationship with him. And not just how can I avoid sin, but how can I do what pleases God? And so the challenge from this scripture and the challenge that I took on is to guard my walk with God. And so what did that look like for me? I had to replay the entire Sunday so that I could see God's hand. And as I replayed that day, I saw the great prayer time I had, the great quiet time I had. I saw the people who hugged me in the fellowship. We need like 12 hugs a day or something. I got like three times as many that day, you know, because of the kingdom of God. Um, I saw the incredible worship, right? The incredible preaching by Matthew where he called us to renew ourselves, to renew our pursuit and to renew our purpose. Um, I saw the incredible D group that we had with the Miles and just the encouragement, the ways that they've been pouring themselves out. And I just saw the faithfulness of God and the fact that God calls himself our shepherd in Ezekiel 34. That it's not us that have to lead his people, but he leads his people and we get to be the vessels. I saw pressure lifted off my shoulders and I pray that as we go through, maybe it's not just replaying our day to see God's hand, but maybe it's the week. Maybe it's the month. We're halfway through 2023. Maybe it's the year. Have you stopped seeing God this year? And I want to encourage you to guard your walk with God. Clean the cup. Get open about what you might be feeling. If there's any bitterness, if there's any hurt, if there's any grief from those who've left, those physically but also those spiritually, If there's been any hope deferred, it's going to be hard to move forward if we're still stuck emotionally. Don't call people to vent. Call people to pray. 
And not only that, pray longer and deeper than you ever have. Pray until you get your hope restored. Pray until your heart changes. Pray until you're surrendered to the outcome that God has. Not necessarily your outcome, but his outcome. And maybe the victory is that your husband doesn't change, but it forges you into a great helper. Are we surrendered to that? Maybe it's that your disciple doesn't stop struggling, but you learn how to keep calling people to the standard in love and not frustration. And it leads to many other people being saved. Maybe it's letting your love overlook an offense. When you can clearly point out a couple things that the other party needs to apologize for. And it just becomes embodying Jesus' spirit where he was accused and said nothing. But we have to guard our walks with God. Point number two, the best of God. So turn with me to Romans 8. This is a popular scripture that we know and love, but we're going to read a little bit before it. In Romans 8, are you guys still with me? Okay. (laughs) Okay, Romans 8. Give me an amen when you're there. Okay, verse 14. And the Bible reads, Romans 8, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And so this scripture is awesome. It says we are led by the spirit of God and we get to be children of God. Meaning one of my favorite um, scriptures is in 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 where it says God's eyes range across the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And so it's incredible because in Christ we don't have to be strong. But when we're committed, he comes and he gives us strength. And so it's really cool because we're led by that same spirit to become children of God. And it doesn't make us enslaved, but it actually brings us freedom. Not only does it bring us freedom, but it says that we get to be God's daughters. And it says that we get to be heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Just think about that for a moment. You get to be a princess in God's kingdom. Jesus is a prince. You get to have that kind of dynamic with Jesus. What? Who are we? And it says that we get to share in his suffering. So sharing in Jesus' sufferings is a promise. It brings a closeness. Nothing brings people together more than struggle. That's why we're so close to our families. We've been through the ups and downs together. And in the family of God, we get to go through the ups and downs together. And it says we will also share in his glory. But it says none of the things that we're going through right now, none of these sufferings will even compare with what that glory will be. And so it's so funny that uh, Chanel lifted me up because I actually wanted to talk about (laughs) Chanel a little bit in my lesson today. And so Chanel and I go way back to 2018 in New York City. So she was my discipler. And if anyone is discipled by me, I still quote all her scriptures and take her D group material and hear her out from time to time to send me her lessons. But it was amazing. But there was one D time that changed my life. 
And she was talking to me about just my identity in Christ and really connecting to the best of God as opposed to still having this underlying desire to just be in God but live out the best version of myself. I don't know if you've ever studied the Bible with someone and they're like, yeah, I just want to be the best version of myself. And you just kind of look at them like, yeah, like that's a byproduct of this. But really, the Bible is meant to transform you. You're not even going to look like yourself after this. And it's not about your best version. It's about responding in gratitude to what Jesus did for you. You know? And so I was still basically trying to build up my own little kingdom. And she had a hard talk with me. And in the conversation, she's like, Regine, on your cloud to heaven, you'll have great travel experiences great internships, great people who love you, but will you have souls? Will you have souls? And it really cut me. And it produced an urgency in me because I'm just like, wow, there's so much about me that hasn't become radical because I'm still trying to save myself my reputation. I want to be loved. I don't want to call people to the hard truths of scripture because then they won't like me the way that they treated Jesus. That's how I'm going to get treated. And it changed my heart, my perspective, and it allowed me to be that kernel of wheat to die, not just in the waters of baptism, but to die again so that others could live. And it really had me questioning, and this is the question that I want to put before you tonight, are you intentional in helping others experience the best of God? Or are you still distracted trying to make the gospel and your life more comfortable? And so I want to lift up a couple people who really have embodied just making the best of God and allowing other people to experience the best of God. And so I wanted to lift up a couple people who don't usually get shouted out but who, who live a quiet life in God, but speaks loudly in their faith. And so the first sister that I want to lift up, I don't even know if she's here tonight, but it's Shamara. I don't know if she's here tonight. So Shamara is one of our teens. I was going to lift up Jada, but I'm glad Charlotte lifted up Jada because I was like torn. I was like, which one? I have to pick one. And so Jada, you're amazing. <laughs> but I wanted to lift up Shamara because I remember when I first moved down to L.A., I found Shamara in the fellowship, and I would always chase her down. Bernisha can attest to this and make her give me a hug and stand up and talk to me. But over the past couple of weeks, I've just seen Shamara in the fellowship just talking to visitors and just encouraging them and building them up. And every time she sees me, she never fails to get open and have true fellowship with me. And I just really appreciate that heart. I also want to lift up Crystal. And so Crystal is amazing, and she's in our campus ministry. And over the past couple of, this past week, I've just seen her fighting to be aligned with God's word. And it's so incredible because tonight her mom is here. <laughs> y señora, estamos super agradecida que podemos compartir su hija. Ella es increíble. Y su pasión para Dios es wow. And I'm just so grateful, and I say wow when I don't know any more Spanish, but I'm so grateful because it's because of her deep conviction that she shares her faith so urgently and so passionately to help as many people know the gospel. I want to lift up Ashley Voltaire. She's in the back. So Ashley's been a disciple for years, and she's one of the heads of our AV team here. Ashley's usually the first to come and the last to leave. And it's been incredible to see the ways that she's been pouring into the women and raising them up so that they can do this. And a lot of our incredible services and the recordings are thanks to her. And she doesn't get lifted up enough. And so we just want to thank you, Ashley. I want to lift up Esther Hernandez somewhere around here. There she is. There she is. And so the past couple of weeks and months have been very, very difficult. And Esther's been going through a lot. 
but to still fight to be at everything, to pour her, ho- her heart into women studying the Bible, and to pray with me at hours where I don't even know if I said anything like coherent, but to see her worshiping God before work, taking care of her kids, wow. And I'm just so amazed by you. And lastly, I wanna lift up Sandra. I don't know if she's here, she's here somewhere. And so this past Sunday, oh, there she is. This past Sunday, we had an awesome mom of one of the brothers who's a disciple come out to church. And she was not happy. She was not happy because her her son was making radical decisions to pursue God, and she could not understand it. And I was grateful for Sandra because she found her in the fellowship. She encouraged her. She shared scriptures with her. And by the end of the service, her mom's, his mom's heart completely changed. Completely changed. She just felt like a little superhero, just like helping her to understand God's vision. And she walked out with so much more faith. And she's like, I want my son to stay a disciple. You know, and so I just want to lift you up, sis. And there's so many more unsung heroes in this crowd. So many of you who live your lives not just seeing the best of God, but helping others to experience the best of God as well. But maybe you have shrunk back. Maybe the past couple of weeks and months and years have taken a toll on your faith. And you've stopped seeing God in the circumstances or you've stopped seeing that God can use you to help someone else. I want to encourage you, sisters, that that's not true at all. That's just Satan trying to get you to be discouraged and to not use the voice and the power and the spirit of love and self-control that God has given you. Because when God wants to give us his best, we know that it's not just for our lives here on earth, but it's for heaven the best that we're ever going to experience is in heaven. And so the challenge from the scripture is to help someone have their best in God. And what does that look like? Making, sharing our faith, our lifestyle. It was really cool because I got to spend some time with the Martinez's, Lou, Jack, and Kathy, and they've been disciples forever. But what impressed me about the Martinez's were they've probably been personally fruitful over a hundred times people that they've reached out to. And so I was just like hearing all these stories. I just love sitting at people's feet. If anybody wants to tell stories, just find me and I'll listen, right? But they're just telling stories how they started a monthly book club and have seven visitors come out and people who want to study the Bible. And they've done um, planners where they go out and they sell planners at the Chamber of Commerce, you know, and start a small business and raise missions that way. But people from the Chamber of Commerce have become disciples. And for many of us, like, we're naturally very awesome people. Like, I just look at your faces and I just want to be your friends. And people in the world, they're used to people looking at them and not even smiling, much less a hello, much less an interest in their relationship with God. And so it's using the spaces that we're already in and just being intentional about allowing ourselves to be vessels for God to reach these people. Because when he chose you, he chose the people around you. He chose your coworkers. He chose your family members. He chose the people at the gas station. He chose your cashier. He chose your boss. He chose the person that hurt your feelings from seventh grade that just showed up on your Facebook feed. He chose all of them. And we just have to open our mouths and say something. And I was trying to come up with some zingers. It's like post-LAMC conference. Everything is a zinger. So hopefully you guys like these ones. But if you can take a quick break, you can share your faith. If you can take your kid to the park, you can leave a spark. If you can go on IG, you can set a soul free. (laughs) Amen. Thanks for laughing, guys. And so I was really inspired by this last one particularly because I got a chance to talk to Michael Williams. Well, Ole talked to Michael Williamson, so we talked to Michael Williamson, even though I wasn't there. And he was sharing how 50% of the people who have gotten baptized and became disciples in Europe were actually reached out to on social media. 
50% of our brothers and sisters across the pond were reached out to on social media. And he also has this famous line, you can't be critical and unfruitful. Yeah, souls are on the line. We can say and we can see all the issues. And it's easy to point out the issues. It takes no talent to point out the issues. But it takes effort and it takes a surrender to God to die to yourself and be part of the solution. And despite the issues, to still be focused on your mission and your purpose from God. And I just want to close out with one scripture in 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to close out here. 2 Corinthians 4. And the Bible reads in verse 16. Give me an amen when you're there. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. The Bible reads, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And I just want to encourage you ladies tonight, though you might be tired, though you might be weary, though you might feel like your vision and your faith and your goals for this year have been taken, I just want to encourage you that the best is yet to come, that the fight is not over. And even just coming back from the retreat and praying through the ways that I've seen God, I've come back with more vision for the women. And yes, people might leave, but man, people will come. And you might think to yourself, but what if I fail? But what if you fly? And just knowing that heaven awaits us. One day we will be worshiping God, right? The sparkly chandeliers, like that's going to be God's face. And it's going to be hard to see it, to even look at it. But it says that we have to focus on what is unseen because that is truly what is eternal. And that will allow us to to be motivated to really understand that God still has the best in store. Thank you so much for allowing me to share tonight. (laughs) 